Well, hello everyone. How is everyone doing in the YouTube world and the Facebook world? Join me and the wonderful guest I have today, distinguished guest. It's my honor and my privilege to introduce Senator Richard Black. How are you, Senator? Good morning. I'm doing Good fine. morning. Good to be For here. For everyone who has followed the story of Senator Black, you know that he is a distinguished, a distinguished um, veteran and uh, he fought in combat in Vietnam War, correct, Colonel? Yes, that's right. I was in Vietnam with the uh, uh, a squadron of helicopters called the Ugly Angels. It was a great, great, very courageous helicopter squadron. I flew 269 combat missions and came back with bullet holes through the plane four times. Uh, some of them hit just uh, about a foot, a uh, foot or two behind my head. And uh, uh, then we were, we were in, uh, uh, in the sea outside of uh, the Philippines and uh, at, uh, at the ready room in the morning when they were giving the morning briefing to all the pilots, they said, uh, we, we have a requirement for one uh, helicopter pilot uh, to volunteer to fight on the ground with the 1st Marine Division, calling in airstrikes, the, calling in the bombs, calling in medical evacuations. And I volunteered to do that. And I fought with the 1st Marine Division in uh, what turned out to be the bloodiest combat of the, of the Vietnam War for the U.S. Marines. And uh, uh, I fought in, in uh, I made 70 combat patrols, many of them where we were actually uh, engaged with the enemy. And uh, towards the end, uh, I was getting ready to come home. And uh, the, uh, there was a, a Marine outpost that was surrounded. And during the night, the artillery started going off I knew something was going on. And then, then I heard uh, my old company, Fox Company, First Marines, getting ready to, uh, to move out to rescue the uh, outpost. And I went out, I volunteered to, to go. Uh, and uh, I bumped into my old radio man. He was supposed to catch the plane out that same day. And I said, what are you doing here, Smitty? And he's, he laughed. He said, "He said same thing as you're doing, or not Colonel, but Lieutenant." And uh, so we went out. We fought our way to the Hoi An River. We crossed under fire in rubber boats. And uh, by the time we got to the other side, engaged with the Viet Cong, um, uh, I was wounded. Both of my radio men were killed. Smitty, God bless him. Uh, he was literally supposed to catch a plane out that day, and uh, uh, they uh, very, very tragic. And anyway, he died quite heroically, gave his life uh, for uh, for the other Marines uh, trying to rescue them. So, so that was uh, that was uh, Vietnam. And the reason that I was in so much combat is that the forward air control team would be attached to whichever Marine infantry company was going into the assault. And so we were just going from attack to attack to attack. So uh, it was quite a, quite a period for me and it, it gives me a, a pretty keen insight into what's going on uh, with the terrible tragedy in, uh, in Ukraine these days, uh, where unfortunately I think the United States is stoking the fires unnecessarily and really, this thing sh should have been resolved very early on with very little bloodshed. But because there are some of these oligarchs, these global oligarchs uh, from the, the wealthy, wealthy families, they make fantastic uh, profits from, from the war. And they're willing to fight to the last drop of Ukrainian blood and all of the all of the Russian blood that goes with it. 
And it's a great tragedy for, for both the Russians and for the Ukrainians whose lives are really being sacrificed for these globalist oligarchs uh, who have prompted the war. They've, they've set the stage for it. And, uh, and now, unfortunately, uh, they're the ones who pay the price. I I was so fascinated with uh, hearing about your combat experience, Colonel. Let me ask you um, to reflect a little bit on your career first. So our viewers, by the way, viewers, say hello, post your comments, uh, type from what countries you're watching and what time is out there. I am here with Colonel and the former Virginia State Senator Richard Black. He is um, our United States colonel and honored veteran. I believe Richard Black has the Purple Heart and two orders of merit, correct? Yes, uh, the and Purple uh, Heart and a number, and a number of other awards. A number of other awards. So I would like to ask Richard about a little bit about his career. He also used to head a criminal law division in the Pentagon. I would like to know a little bit about that. He's also... Uh, as I mentioned, a public servant, he served in the state senate of uh, state senate of the uh, state of Virginia, and of course he is uh, outspoken and um, I would say the most honest person who is uh, with this extensive record on public service is speaking about the war in Ukraine and speaking the truth about NATO involvement and about Biden administration. Um, and, and what is has been done by NATO to fuel this conflict in Ukraine. So it's my privilege to have Richard. Everybody type your comments and say hellos so we know who is watching us. Uh, Senator, may I ask you, going back, when did you start your service? Just to touch a little bit more about your life story. How well, old were you? <clears throat> I was 19 when I started. Uh, uh, I, I had been, I was a chemistry major at University of Miami, ran out of money, went down, signed up for the Marine Corps, and uh, I had I had the hope of becoming a pilot, which was the one way that I could become a commissioned officer without having a degree, and uh, uh, against uh, tremendous odds, because I, I suffered from, from motion sickness, so... I was I was out there doing air to air combat with uh, with other T28 uh, aircraft and we we'd be pulling 4G's positive and then 2G's or 3G's negative and and your stomach is rising and falling so but anyway I got commissioned and uh, uh, and uh, shortly thereafter I was in Vietnam I was fighting over there so Anyway, after the after the year in Vietnam, came back and uh, uh, I was close to getting out. And uh, then they needed officers, and and uh, I I transferred into engineers. I became a an engineer company commander. Eventually, went back to school. Went to, to University of Florida this time for a degree in accounting and for a law degree. And after that, I, I ended up uh, back in uniform. I, I was a major in the Marines. I switched over to the Army, was, a, was an Army major, and then rose to the rank of Colonel uh, in the JAG Corps. And the JAG Corps is, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's the attorneys who, who uh, prosecute the crimes, who do the federal litigation, who are involved in environmental, administrative law, this kind of thing. And I ran several major legal operations. Uh, at uh, I was the staff judge advocate at uh, Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, at Fort Ord, California, and at Fort Lewis, Washington. And uh, uh, some, some very exciting things that took place there, uh, including uh, in 1992, I was uh, instrumental in ending the race riots that swept through uh, Los Angeles, very, very deadly, debilitating. Uh, and uh, because of a legal opinion that I gave to the commander who was going down there that enabled them to, to employ 
much more force than the California National Guard had done. And within a period of several days, we, we ended the riots and brought order. So there were, there were many things like that. But uh, I eventually became the chief of the criminal law division at the Pentagon and uh, uh, got kind of an eye opener to uh, the way that the federal bureaucracy in Washington views the law and the regulations uh, sometimes a little more flexibly than we did out in the field. Um, uh, you know, when I, when I was practicing, I, I, was, I was naively going along and uh, applying the, the Constitution, the laws, the regulations, uh, and uh, obeying them rather meticulously and uh, discovered a few little exceptions in Washington, D.C. Um, but in any event, you know, it, it was a good experience because I have served in all branches of government. Uh, after I retired in 94, uh, I was elected to the Virginia House of Delegates, uh, served there for eight years. Uh, later served eight years in the Virginia Senate. And um, uh, quite, a, quite a wonderful experience. Um, in the course of all of this, I've, uh, I, I will back up just a little. When I came out of Vietnam, this was in 67, I came back to a country that had changed rather dramatically. It was in the midst of, of a, a real sea change. And I, I remember um, being quite shocked because I, I, would, I would be out late at night because I, I hunted in the, in the Florida Everglades. I, I hunt snakes. In fact, I just came back from, from a really? hunting trip out there uh, this week and uh, caught a couple of water moccasins. But I was, I was quite taken aback by the fact that you, you'd go out, you'd be out at one o'clock in the morning and there'd be 15 year old girls hitchhiking alone down the road. Now, I mean, I have as much interest in, 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 in I had as, as, as any man in girls, but, but what it, it distressed me because it showed the, the erosion of American culture that uh, you'd have never seen anything like this before, but all of a sudden you have this drugs and sex and, and just sort of a, a, a collapse of the social structure in America. And it was very disturbing to me and uh, it, that was when you came back from Vietnam, right? Came back from Vietnam. That's and, what you observed, that you, you suddenly felt that the society is not the same anymore. That's right. Right. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, society had, had changed radically uh, under, under the pressures of the civil rights movement and the drugs and all of the things going on. And uh, it, it really has kind of launched me on sort of a political course um, that began at a, at a very early stage in life. So uh, I, I, I'm at a point where, I mean, during the Biden administration, we've seen sort of a, a revolutionary upheaval with the, with the cities being burned, with people being chased through the streets by mobs, uh, with police being assassinated, uh, dozens and dozens of, of police just sitting by in their cars by the roadside. People come up and, and gun them down. And the media has thought, oh, this is, this is great fun because, uh, the, you know, the, the BLM and Antifa crowd, they're, they're out there showing that they, they got a lot of power and the, the media egged them on. And, uh, and of course, there, there are always really bad elements out there that are, that are ready to respond. And there were, there were people, and I, I think I know names, but I won't say them on the air, but there were billionaires who were funding the BLM Antifa riots. Uh, we know that in some of them, 
uh, as the rioters would be, you know, surging down streets, somebody had purchased pallets of bricks and laid them along the route so that the mobs could grab the bricks and hurl them through windows and, and hurl them at people. Now, that didn't just happen. It, it, these, these demonstrations, they're very expensive. Yes, they are. And it reminds me of Ukraine in 2014. That pretty much was the same thing. They, there were all of a sudden a lot of street violence. And the next thing you know, there was a regime change. But um, yeah, yeah. Uh, Colonel, what about what was it like working in Pentagon? And now with all the war situation in Russia, Ukraine, and now we're worried about China, Taiwan. And then there is uh, Israel, Iran, and of course, um, United States helping Israel. With all the wars and the situation, how do you view Pentagon and what was it like when you worked there? What maybe American people do not know what Pentagon really is? What Give us some insight, some scoop. What it was like to be a chief of criminal law division of Pentagon. Most of us wouldn't even have ever known what it's like to walk down those corridors, and you did. Give us some insights and put it in a perspective. What does, is Pentagon's role in all these wars that we have continuously here in the United States? It's important to remember or, or to realize that the Pentagon in the early 90s is, was totally different than the Pentagon today. Um, I was there at the point where Bill Clinton was elected president, and uh, he uh, he was a sworn enemy of of the military. Uh, he he had famously said that he said I loathe the military, and uh, he took the opportunity of the. Um, uh, he went down uh, to the to the uh, to the Pentagon wall, to the Vietnam Wall, in uh, not in the Pentagon, but out on the Capitol Mall, the uh, the uh, memorial to all the the dead of Vietnam, and he went down there uh, to sort of sort of you know stomp on the graves of all of the veterans. And he said, I'm going to put uh, known homosexuals in uniform. And uh, uh, of course, uh, they were prohibited from, from uh, entering service on active duty at the time that I was in as the chief of the criminal law division. And uh, <clears throat> there ensued an enormous political battle between the Pentagon, which wanted to maintain standards, and Bill Clinton who wanted to tear down the Pentagon and, and really American culture. Um, I, I remember, you know, as the chief of the criminal law division for the army, I was in charge of all death penalty cases for all the services, whether they were Navy, Air Force, Army, they all came under me. There were about 10, 10 people who had been sentenced to death. And, what was the uh, sentence for? What did they do? Well, I'll give you one example. Um, these are not people who got convicted for being in a barroom brawl. But there was one that kind of stood out in my mind. He was a very frightening, domineering father. Uh, he decided to murder all of his family. He had quite a number of of children, he had a wife, and he forced all of them to stand in line as he, he filled the bathtub with water, and then in turn, he would take each one of them while the others were forced to stand in line and drown them, and they would watch as their mother was drowned, and she's struggling and thrashing and desperately trying to get out. Wow. And they know they're next. And he, he, he just created this sense of enormous horror. 
And this that was the type of thing. It wasn't just ordinary murders. So this were military people, and they are uh, judged yeah. under the military tribunal, so to speak, right? Yes. Is that it, how? It's very much like like the federal court system today, but you have you have uniform military jurors, uh, and uh, that's the main difference. Is the is the jury is is different in the military than in, in a civilian federal court. But all of these had been convicted. Um, the entire military justice system had been, had been completely scrubbed to make sure it complied with every, uh, every rule that was in place, every court decision. But when Clinton came in, he knew that that none of these would have a problem getting final approval from the Supreme Court for the executions. And I was ready to move forward and get them all all cleared out, execute the whole bunch of them. And uh, Bill Clinton ordered a complete review of the system that had been completely reviewed and revised and just for years, there'd been this monumental effort, but he knew that by doing that, he would postpone the execution and, and eventually they would not be executed. As far as I know, they probably never have been. So you would say that the changes to Pentagon, what we see Pentagon as being now have been basically originated since Clinton's era. Yes, uh, what happened is before Bill Clinton was in office, the, the officers who were promoted uh, tended to be promoted based on merit. Uh, when, when uh, you know, there was always a little bit of a thumb on the, on the scales to try to bring in this group or that group, but it was generally a fair system. When Bill Clinton came in, it was totally based on non-merit factors. And, um, and then you had this followed up when you had, uh, you had Obama for two, two terms. Now you've got Biden. All of the general officers uh, today have been selected under this, except for, for Trump during the Trump period, but uh, all the others have been selected on non-merit. They're based on the color of their skin, based on, on their uh, sexual proclivities, uh, various things that are uh, certainly not conducive to a strong moral uh, leadership environment. So, uh, so if we have a new Republican president, one of the things he's got to do uh, is he must go in and he must purge those generals because these people are, they're dangerous, they're irresponsible, they're incompetent. Uh, we have never seen the kind of, kind of cultural and leadership dis, uh, uh, decay in the military that we have today. It's just, it's astounding. Well, we can't recruit anymore. I think our recruitment uh, is down like what, 30%. And then we're trying to start nuclear war with Russia while we can't even recruit enough soldiers. We're trying to agitate China while we again cannot recruit enough soldiers. What are we insane? What do you think, Colonel? Uh, is United States uh, going to get into war with China? And and uh, what's happening with Russia? Are we trying to get us closer to nuclear war with Russia through Ukraine? Are we insane? Is Pentagon out of their mind? Elena, I, let me just run through some of the things that we have done in uh, in Ukraine. Uh, this is how reckless we've gotten. We targeted the flagship of the Russian fleet, the Moskva. Moskva. 
this is a very large, very large ship, uh, and we sunk it. Now, did we press the button? We probably did, but it could have been a Ukrainian doing what we told them to do. Yeah. We sank that ship, and we sent to the bottom 300 young Russian sailors. Uh, then we targeted 13 Russian generals for assassination. We killed them all, killed 13 of them. Now, I think I think that the Ukrainians did it based on the intelligence. Intelligence, and, yeah. And this is where you're sitting right next to somebody who's Ukrainian because it's got to be done in real time. You don't just say, oh, there's a general and here's yeah. a here's a briefing paper about him. No, you have to be able to say, here he is. He's at this precise location uh, within one square meter right at this instant, and then they fire. Well, <clears throat> that's the, the United States assassinating Russian generals. Uh, we, we helped the Ukrainians, and, and this was certainly done by the United States, we helped them launch a drone that went deep into Russia, uh, hundreds and hundreds of miles, and we attacked a nuclear site uh, where uh, Russian bombers were there, the bombers that are part of their nuclear triad to respond to a United States attack. And we, we actually did some damage to one of their, uh, their nuclear bombers. Yeah. Now, probably the most utterly insane thing that we have done, if those aren't enough, is we blew up the Nord Stream 1 and 2 pipelines which are the, the artery that, that feeds blood into the beating heart of Europe. And this was an act of war against Russia, but it was also an act of war against Germany. It was an act of war, I think, I think Denmark is involved in this. Uh, I think uh, Switzerland, it was an act of war against Switzerland. And, and, it was so transparently obvious that we were doing it. Uh, we were doing it for various reasons. One, to capture the natural gas market for the United States. And I'm all in favor of, of us trying to get advantage, but not, you know. <laughs> not I, through terrorist acts, uh, attacking our own allies, right? That's right. And, and then mean, blaming it on Russia. It's very much like, you know, I believe in in competition between Costco and Walmart. Yeah. But if if uh, Walmart were to to give uh, lead goes pipes, and blows up Costco at night. Yeah, if they were if they were to give lead pipes to all their, their warehouse and say, let's go over there and let's smash the smash yep. the windows and beat up some people in Costco. No, that's a crime. And when we when we destroy the pipeline to Europe. It is a crime. It is, it's the greatest act of terrorism committed since 9-11. So, uh, so when, when you mention, uh, you mention uh, nuclear war, there was a very interesting article, a very good article in the Washington Post today. They almost buried their own article. You have to look for it, but uh, it, it's it's entitled "A Republican Civil War on Ukraine Erupts as Reagan's Example Fades." Now, I don't like their title too much, but their subtitle is better. GOP leaders and voters are increasingly skeptical of an extended commitment, part of a broader shift away from conservative support for foreign interventions. Basically, what they're saying is the the uh, Republican rank and file and some of the leadership are uh, starting to get pretty fed up with all these foreign interventions. But here's just one line I wanted to mention while we're on this. And I was a little surprised. It sort of stood out to me uh, in the article. 
and they're talking about sort of the apparent stalemate, which I don't think is a stalemate anymore, but uh, it says, but the prospect of a decisive victory by either side seems less likely than a grinding war of attrition with the possibility of a dangerous nuclear confrontation lurking just over the horizon. Yep. Who would initiate this, this nuclear confrontation? It wouldn't be Russia. Yeah. They, don't want it. they don't want a confrontation. It wouldn't be China. They don't want it. And it, it wouldn't be uh, France or, or the United Kingdom. There is one country that would initiate a nuclear war, and there's already been little low-level chatter about it, and that would be the United States. We have, we have a policy uh, that uh, allows for first use of nuclear weapons, which means that uh, we could launch a nuclear Pearl Harbor, uh, hoping to knock out the nuclear defenses of, of Russia. Now, and, and there are some, some absolute lunatics uh, who believe this is a good idea, but they better remember that... Uh, the Russians have nuclear submarines off our coast, and uh, at the first, the first nuclear strike over there, New York City is turned to radioactive glass. Washington D.C. You think of all these monuments in the Capitol building and all. Yeah, that. I've been there. It's beautiful city. Yeah. Yes, and imagine if suddenly nothing was standing. And all that you had was just a sea of molten glass. That's what you will have within minutes after uh, the the White House gives the okay to launch a nuclear strike. So I hope that doesn't tempt anyone. Do you think, Colonel, that um, or should I say, Senator? You have so many titles. I will I will alternate. There is so many. I want everybody to know. By the way, everybody who is watching us, make sure you write some comments. And uh, if you have some questions for uh, Senator Black, feel free to type them. I'll come back to all your comments afterwards. But do you, Senator, think that um, the North Korea is becoming a problem as well because the United States carries out these uh, military exercises with South, South Korea? And uh, uh, the North Korean leader is saying that this is like a declaration of war on North Korea. I mean, I'm thinking if if Biden decides to nuke Russia, uh, who knows? You know, we may get nuked by, uh, what is it, Northern Korea before that. If they keep pressing the buttons of this... Um, Guy, what is his name? Uh, Kim Jong and uh, Ping or something? Kim I mean, <laughs> yes. Uh, I mean, he, he has nuclear weapons too. Are we trying to get nuked by everyone at the same time? I mean, Russia, North Korea, and China? I mean, are we insane? You know, North Korea is a very special situation. Um, the thing that people need to understand about uh, about North Korea is that the, the line between North Korea and South Korea is just a very short distance from the South Korean capital of Seoul, Korea. Seoul is dominant. It's, it's by far the greatest population and industrial center in the entire country. And I believe that you could actually fire conventional artillery rounds and reach the capital of Seoul from the mountains uh, surrounding them that are over in North Korea. So there, it's always been a, a uh, sort of a checkmate situation where the South, the South Korean army is far more powerful than the North Korean army. It's more modern, it's better equipped, it's, it's uh, really an excellent force, or at least it was when I, when I 
flew them into battle back in uh, many years ago. So maybe it's changed. But anyway, uh, North Korea is in a position to to absolutely annihilate uh, South Korea. And so really the only practical thing you can do with North Korea is to deal with them in some sort of a diplomatic fashion. President Trump recognized this. I think he, he did an excellent job. He diffused tensions. Uh, he recognized, okay, we can't just bully them. We can't just you know, put a lot of, you know, a lot of ships sailing around the coast and, and fly planes nearby, all the typical garbage that we do. Let's just, let's just talk with them. And everybody's, oh, you're crazy. You should be blustering. You should be bullying. But we probably had the best relations that we've had with, with North Korea almost since, since it began. Yeah. And that was under Trump. He did a good job. Um, so, so there, there's a situation that's special. But the problem is, we just have this knee-jerk reaction that you have to threaten, you have to bully, you have to overthrow governments, you have to infiltrate them. You know the. The countries of the world have lost so much faith in America. When I when I served in Europe, I was the deputy staff judge advocate, which is the number two guy for the biggest legal organization that the army had in Europe. And uh, I had five separate offices that I directly supervised in three different countries. And one of the things I did on the side is I was responsible for all military justice for affecting American soldiers and, and military people uh, throughout the Middle East and Africa. That wasn't a big, uh, a big issue back then. Uh, I had some very interesting cases I can remember out of Egypt and out of uh, Saudi Arabia, very diplomatically sensitive things. But I can tell you back in those days, I could have flown to Amman, Jordan. I could have rented a motorcycle uh, and I could, have, I could have driven all through Syria and Iraq and uh, uh, into Iran. I could have gone anywhere in relative safety. Uh, there wouldn't there would not have been any terrorists. Uh, people would have been friendly because they liked Americans back then. Um, and in the Middle East was not a it was not a terribly dangerous place. It, you know, crime was not a big issue there. You look at where things have have gone since we took an aggressive posture. Today, uh, <laughs> When, in, in 2016, I flew into Syria and uh, the Syrian army had just driven out ISIS, which had a, a major, just a huge attack on the desert city of Palmyra. ISIS seized the city. The Syrian army took it back. I flew in just after it was recaptured. And... Uh, uh, I, I eventually had to go from, from Palmyra to home Syria. And instead of getting on a motorcycle like I might have done when I was younger, uh, I had a convoy, I think of 16 vehicles. Some of them had automatic cannons mounted. Um, uh, we had two, two attack helicopters we had a we had a, a jet aircraft loaded with bombs and we left and we went out across the desert through ISIS held territory and the the entire the entire convoy was under my personal command and uh, 
but they were prepared to start dropping bombs and to, to making runs with attack helicopters if we got uh, if we got hit en route. So you compare. You know, yeah. earlier I could have gone out there on a motorcycle and waved at people as I went by. Here I had to have uh, elite forces in 16 vehicles with cannon and, and helicopters. Head. So and 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 Senator, I've, I've watched some of your interviews before, and you did say that the um, uh, United States is illegally occupying Syria. Is that correct? Because my understanding, Matt Getz, a Republican congressman, the other day introduced a resolution uh, basically saying that we need to bring our troops back. I believe we have 900 troops over there, 900 soldiers or something along those lines. And the Congress overwhelmingly rejected that resolution to bring our troops back, while a Republican congressman says Congress never authorized them to be there in the first place. How is it possible that our troops are in countries without Congress authorization? And what's wrong with our congressmen then when one of them actually sees the lights and said, we need to bring our troops back, we didn't authorize this uh, deployment, they all say, oh no, we'll keep our troops there. I mean, what are we doing in Syria? Um, are we occupying it for the sake of oil or what are we doing there? Let me start by talking about uh, Representative Matt Gates. He's a Republican uh, conservative out of Florida a uh, very courageous uh, individual. Uh, he introduced a resolution uh, to withdraw American forces who were illegally occupying uh, Syria. Now, the resolution, the vote on the resolution failed. However, this in a, in a sense was a significant victory in terms of the movement of, of uh, where things are going in Congress. Up until this, uh, on this bill was voted on, not a single Democrat had broken ranks with the war hawks. Uh, there, was, there was a moment where 30 of them had signed a letter to Biden. They sent it to Biden saying, hey, look, we got to- took it back. <laughs> it, it said, yeah, we've, we're, we're, we're headed towards nuclear war. We better cool it. And in one day, all of them had been browbeaten into bringing it back. In this vote uh, that on, on the Matt Gates resolution, there actually were more Democrats than Republicans who voted for it. 56 Democrats voted yes, 47 Republicans voted yes. And that is a powerful, powerful message that the American people are fed up. The political elites are beginning to realize there is a massive shift in public opinion underway. Now, let me just back up and, if I could, just give you a quick summary of, of what has happened in Syria. Uh, Barack Obama, as you know, he was given the Nobel Peace Prize uh, before he had, I think he, I, I don't know if he had even actually been sworn into office. He was given a peace prize for what he was going to do. Well, he turned out to be one of the most grisly, bloodthirsty presidents in American history. Uh, he launched an unprovoked attack on Libya, yeah. which at the time was the most civilized, prosperous uh, country in Africa. He absolutely destroyed it. It has not, Libya has not had a functioning government ever since we invaded in 2011 under the orders of Barack Obama. Uh, so we did that. And the reason we did it, there were two reasons, but the, the one that's relevant here is that Libya had an enormous supply of weapons, modern weapons. Even before we had uh, cleared the, the Libyan government from Libya, we gave control of, of a uh, 
an airfield in Libya to the Turks. And uh, the nation of Qatar began flying aircraft in and they landed, the Turks loaded the aircraft with modern weapons, uh, missiles, with all kinds of things. And then they sent them to Turkey. And in Turkey, the CIA established a secret program called Timber Sycamore. And mm -hmm. under Timber Sycamore, they, they established all of these massive warehouses filled with billions and billions of dollars of weapons. And, um, uh, and then we began, we put the CIA in on the ground to coordinate with Al Qaeda and all of the Al Qaeda linked terrorists. Uh, now, this is just 10 years after 9 11 when Al Qaeda flew the jets into the Twin Towers and the Pentagon. And here we were in a firm alliance that continues to this very day. We've been unwavering supporters of, of Al Qaeda in Syria. And we began flowing weapons captured from Libya. We sent them across the Turkish border into Syria. And, uh, and we, we began this massive terror campaign against the legitimate, duly elected government, the constitutional government of Syria. <clears throat> and, Just like uh, we did in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And it, this this is an war that just started domestically because people rose up against President Assad. This was a war that was funded, armed, promoted, planned by the Central Intelligence Agency and the U.S. State Department. And uh, <clears throat> if if the American people could understand how hideous the war in Syria was, they, they would be so aghast that the government would fall overnight. You know, it's, it's an unfortunate thing. In wartime, there are rapes that do occur. They're crimes. Um, but in Syria, it was the policy of these radical Islamic terrorists that if you could capture, <clears throat> if you could capture a Syrian woman, you owned her. She was a slave. You could rape her and you could rape her daughter. You could rape her son if you happen to be one of those kinds. Um, and this is the way that they attracted uh, volunteers from countries around the world who went there knowing, hey, <clears throat> this is really neat. If I go into battle, if I capture some women, some children, I actually own them. I can buy them. I can sell them as slaves. Just market. like medieval style. Yeah. Medieval style society return to owning humans as slaves. Yes. They actually had, uh, they had price lists for, for women that you purchased on the slave markets. These are our allies. These are the people... We support them. And the you know, you know which women on the price list went for the highest prices? It was the little girls. Oh my god. It was the little girls, because you had pedophiles. There was a there was one of the uh, one of the fighters for one of the groups. They're all allied with, with uh, Al Qaeda. And this fellow had a 13-year-old child. He would strip her naked before he would go into battle. He had, a, he had a U.S. Humvee, and he would tie her across his windshield naked. Why did he do this? He did it because he knew that when he went roaring down the road in his Humvee, the Syrian army was a civilized army. They were decent. They were good people. And they, would they wouldn't not kill shoot. Him. They wouldn't yeah. shoot at a little girl. Yeah. Yeah. And so he, he had success. I don't know whatever happened to him. Uh, his time must have run out at some point. But 
He was he was literally doing this. The, it was the 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 volume of rape in Syria was so bad that the last time I spoke to uh, President Assad in 2018, we met in his office. Um, he he told me that uh, they had an initiative underway in their parliament uh, to, they had taken up legislation to change the way that citizenship works in Syria, because under the traditional Arabic way of doing things, uh, the, the citizenship flowed from the father. So he was the father, and there were literally tens and perhaps hundreds of thousands of Syrian women who had been raped uh, and become pregnant. And now the, the father was some disgusting troll who lived in Tunisia or, or Saudi Arabia or somewhere else. And maybe he had impregnated some 12 year old girl and, and he's still the, still the, the father. And they actually had to change the law. And I was told later that the, the proposed changes did go through so that they would be able to, to treat the children of rape more humanely. Not a single American newspaper has ever written an article on this policy of rape. It's just censored, it's silenced. It's insane. So basically, in Syria, um, Matt Getz uh, was correct. We are not there with any type of Congress authorization. But in your legal mind, that now that Congress voted against his resolution to remove troops from there, would that be considered as legal authorization? I think it... it to some extent, you could you could you could make that argument. I, I think that would be a, a legitimate argument. But keep in mind, the United States does not follow laws. When when we when we decide we want to kill somebody, assassinate somebody, uh, we want to overthrow a government, we don't care about the law. Uh, look. We don't care whether every single man, woman, and child in Ukraine dies. We really don't. Not, not you and I do, the American people do. But I'm saying that the decision makers within the beating heart of the war machine, the Central Intelligence Agency, the, uh, the State Department, the FBI, the National intelligence organization, they don't care a whit about the lives and the future of all of these people in Ukraine. To them, it's just, it's a game of power, of money, of influence. And I'll tell you right now, the, the global oligarchs, the, I call them the boys from Davos, uh, they're, they're not necessarily citizens of any country. They, they really consider themselves global, global citizens. And they're the ones who decided that we were gonna go to war. And uh, uh, even though the United States gave the authorization to do it, but the, the word came down from above the level of President Biden that you're gonna do this. And they want that war to continue because you know, right now, what is it, 120, 140 billion dollars, huge, just seas of money that are going over there. They want this war to continue because the longer it does, the more they get to siphon off a billion here, a billion there. Um, yeah. But there, there, there are people becoming just fantastically wealthy. Uh, on the blood of the Ukrainian people and the Russian people. Colonel, uh, how are we doing on time? Do we have some more time or do you need to go? 
No, no, I think we can we can continue. We can go. Okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, guys, everybody, I see a lot of comments over there. Keep typing your comments. I will get back to them after I'm um, asking a few more questions here. Um, and and um, thankfully, I have Senator's time. Guys, type what countries you're watching. And if you have some questions for Senator Black, please type them in. We'll uh, review them uh, in a little bit. Um, Talking about the war in Ukraine, it was a, a good segue. So in Syria, we basically have the troops were unauthorized. We're working with Al Qaeda, and it sounds like Russians are basically the good guys helping legitimate legal government of Assad in Syria. And so now we are, we are the bad guy again in ukraine russia situation because during obama administration victoria newland handpicked ukrainian government after they removed and sponsored eu and united states a state department uh, victoria newland was giving out cookies to protesters um, in the maidan square in front of ukraine's parliament in 2014 to basically ignite that what they call revolution of dignity, which we all know was basically a militarized coup that removed legally elected president in Ukraine, Yanukovych. So we seem to be a bad guy in Syria. We seem to be a bad guy in Ukraine. But the problem of it is that media continues and perpetuates lies about Ukraine. We cannot even find out what Biden and Hunter Biden dealings were in Ukraine from our media. Uh, Congress doesn't really investigate these guys. The D DOJ's department does not want to investigate any of that. So how will American people ever learn the truth, Senator? What do you think? Because they keep still lying that it's Russia who started the war in Ukraine. Um, can you, Senator, say to everyone that the war in Ukraine started in 2014, following the illegal removal of legally elected, democratically elected president, which Victoria Nuland handpicked the coup government after that president was removed? But you can't even hear that line in the media. They keep lying for nine almost years about the war in Ukraine to us, and they will keep doing it for another nine. And more Ukrainians will die, more Russians will die. What would you say, Senator Black? When can we learn the truth about Ukraine and what American people don't know about Ukraine that would help them to clear their mind about the whole thing between Russia and Ukraine? Yeah, this the war has been a great illusion, a great propaganda victory for the deep state. Um, <clears throat> You know, I, I consider it to be Obama's folly. Obama was the one who made the decision that we were going to go to war with Russia. And in 2014, uh, under Victoria Nuland was, was the head of all of this. She was a high ranking official of the State Department. And she went to Ukraine and there, there was a dispute. Uh, they had a a pro-Russian president. He was duly elected, uh, President uh, Yanukovych. And uh, Ukraine was always in fiscal difficulties. So they asked the EU to, to make a proposal of assistance they could provide. And they asked Russia, could you submit a proposal? They looked at the two proposals they chose the Russian proposal, which was much more concrete because Russia does so much business with Ukraine. And uh, Yanukovych signed off on that. Well, immediately NATO made the decision, okay, that can't stand. We have to overthrow the government. Um, there, there was a most violent and vicious uh, it started off as a as a uh, as a demonstration, but the I don't know precisely who put the the snipers up. Whether it was the CIA, I'm sure the CIA was involved. MI6, British MI6 was involved. But what they do when there is a big ruckus going on and demonstrations, 
they'll put these snipers up in the in the windows and they'll shoot a uh, a demonstrator and then they'll shoot a police officer and then they'll shoot some more demonstrators some more police officers and soon the people on the ground everybody thinks they're being shot at by the other side this is this is textbook cia mi6 uh, who knows i guess in the old soviet union it was probably a technique used by stalin who was probably the most vicious human being who who's ever graced the planet. Um, but uh, the fact is that uh, Victoria Newland was actually negotiating and having talks with President Yanukovych. And at the same time, she was intercepted on her cell phone, communicating about who she was going to put in charge of the new revolutionary junta that was about to take over. <clears throat> there was a dramatic photograph on the front pages of the, the Washington Times, or I'm sorry, the Washington Post. And it was, it was something, I, I wish I had a copy, but there was a bunker dug into the ground right outside of the, the presidential headquarters there. And they were throwing Molotov cocktails. They actually had timbers over the top of it. It was a very militaristic bunker. This was the revolutionaries. This wasn't the government. The revolutionaries had, had dug this. And one of them had taken a Molotov cocktail and he, he went back and he threw it and he hit the, the Molotov cocktail on one of the timbers and it burst. And so you have this dramatic photograph with these with these revolutionary protesters and everything's on fire. The protesters are in flames and it just captured the, the violence of what was doing going on. So eventually the, the, the protesters forced Yanukovych to flee and they installed a revolutionary junta, which was very radical. And that junta changed the constitution of Ukraine so that it removed Russian as a legitimate language to be used in the country. And immediately this made <clears throat> all of the Russian speaking Ukrainians <clears throat> into second class citizens. Teachers could no longer teach because they couldn't speak Ukrainian, then you get fired. Um, and so at that point, uh, the Russian speaking areas on the borders of Ukraine, Crimea and the Donbass republics, they declared their independence. Now, every, every news story says they illegally did this or that. I'm gonna tell you, those republics, the Crimea and the Donbass republics had more reason to declare independence than the colonies did in the United States. We did it over, over the fact that we had to pay a few pennies in taxes, but these people literally couldn't speak their language. Imagine if some foreign country came in and said, well, tomorrow everybody has to speak French or you're gonna lose your job. I don't speak French. Um, and uh, so, so they did, they declared their independence. But these were Russians, ethnic Russians in the Donbass, ethnic Russians in Crimea. They were not ethnic Ukrainians. They just, they just happened to find themselves on the wrong side of the line. The United States poured weapons in to build up a huge Ukrainian army, much larger than the, the active uh, Russian army. And, and they fought a war against the, the Russian speaking people for seven or eight years before Russia finally was forced to take action. President Putin had avoided it year after year after year. Finally, he was forced because he feared that the Ukrainian army was about to assault the Donbass republics, which are Russians on the Russian border and he politically, there's no way that he could refrain from intervening. And he decided to get in at that point. So it was 
NATO under the direction of the United States. NATO does not make a move that's not dictated by the United States. So in Washington, under the Biden administration, decision was made that we would go to war, not merely to reestablish the lines and recapture the Russian speaking areas of Ukraine, but that we would make war on Russia. That was, that was the decision within the CIA and the State Department. The objective was not just Ukraine. The objective was war against Russia. We were going to dismantle Russia as a country, and we were going to have all of these global oligarchs take control of vast amounts of wealth. We would create trillionaires out of some of the boys from Davos. And I use... I use boys from Davos. I'm not just talking about the, the groups there, but all of these all of these secretive groups that get together and plan the future of the world for, for the little people. Uh, those of us who cling to our guns and Bibles, as Obama used to say so contemptuously when he'd refer to the American people. Thank you very much, Senator, for your perspective and, and quick overview for those Americans who are still asleep and do not understand that war in Ukraine started in 2014. And we know, as you duly noted, that um, Putin tried to avoid to ever getting into Ukraine because they had Minsk agreements and the Minsk agreements were guaranteed by Germany and France. And the Minsk agreements were to cease fire between militias of the eastern Ukraine, Donbass region, and the state of Ukraine, which Americans don't understand. Ukraine, the state of Ukraine, was waging the war on its own citizens for the last almost nine years and counting. Because after the coup, Ukraine started bombing eastern Ukraine, the Donbass region. And Biden will not tell us anything about it. They will not admit that Minsk agreements were a sham. But now Angela Merkel and the French President Hollande, they came out and said, oh, yeah, we never uh, you know, wanted or intended to have Ukraine implement this ceasefire agreements and uh, all the, the other things that were attached to them because we just wanted to buy Ukraine more time to attack Donbass, to build Ukraine's military to the NATO standards, to then wage the assault on Donbass. So this whole situation about war in Ukraine that we hear in the media and from Biden is a bunch of lies. And American people buying into it, keep repeating the narratives. Oh, Russia is aggressor, you know, Putin is crazy. Uh, and, and I'm thinking we will never solve any problems if we never know the facts. Wouldn't you agree, Senator? I agree. I do think, though, that uh, that uh, shows like yours have a very positive influence. People are beginning to to understand. And, uh, you know, we've got Tucker Carlson, very courageous. I don't agree with him on everything. Uh, he, he and I differ on the issue of, uh, of China. I, I just, frankly, I don't think we need to go to nuclear war with anybody, whether it's China, whether it's North Korea, whether it's Russia. Um, I, I just don't think we need to do it. Um, but, uh, but fortunately, we do have some voices in the, in the mainstream media that are just too big to... Uh, to take down, they're they're too profitable, <clears throat> but uh, but we are we are getting the word out and we are turning the tide, and that's why the you know the Washington Post they almost buried their own story. You have to search for it, uh, and uh, uh, there's some tiny little byline at the end of one story, <clears throat> but it talks about the tremendous shift in sentiment where the GOP is now moving away from foreign interventionism and returning to the idea of America first. Um, 
they, they pointed out that Ron DeSantis said that, uh, that Ukraine is not a vital security interest. And uh, he says he considers it just to be a territorial dispute between the parties. And uh, President Trump agreed. He said uh, that we should make them negotiate a, a peace deal, uh, that uh, Ukraine should be willing to give up these Russian speaking areas. He didn't say it that way, but they should be willing to, to sacrifice some territory for, for that. And uh, so I, you do see this, this shift taking place. Hopefully it'll be a permanent one. But uh, remember a former Vice President Pence and that Tucker Carson, uh, Carlson's um, review or I guess questionnaire that you just mentioned that Tucker submitted to the Republican presidential candidates and the potential candidates, the um, former Vice President Mike Pence responded that no, we, something along the lines that there is no room for Putin apologists, something like that. And uh, in other words, his position is quite contrary to that position of Trump and even Ron DeSantis. What would you make up of Mike Pence's position and the fact that everybody who seems to be speaking out the truth about the war in Ukraine is getting a label of uh, I don't know, Putin's puppet, a Putin apologist, or uh, what is it, put on the Ukraine's kill list, blacklist, hit list, um, and um, <clears throat> Senator Rand Paul is on that list, Ukraine's list. Your name is there, Scott Reader, Colonel McGregor, Tulsi Gabbard. So in other words, how is that nowadays, every time someone speaks the truth, that they have been labeled Russian propagandist or Putin's apologist. And I was quite shocked to see Mike Pence, former vice president, former, you know, right hand man of Trump administration, basically contradicting Trump's uh, response on this questionnaire and going as far as, you know, calling people names and Putin's apologist for holding a different position than his, than his own. And I find it just pretty shocking, to be honest. You know, one of, one of the principal tools of propaganda experts is to smear your opponent. If, if they make an argument that's very difficult to refute, if they say something that you just can't argue your way out of, then you smear them personally and say, okay, their opinion doesn't count because uh, they, you know, Putin apologists. What, what, what a stupid thing. What, it, what information does that convey except that this is somebody who understands the, the Russian point of view? Um, I'm going to tell I you. I would like a definition, like um, Mr. Pence, let's get the definition of what, what exactly is Putin apologist. Does that mean that the person who speaks the truth qualifies about Ukraine war? I mean, because it looks like there is no middle line. You either have to be for Biden or you immediately for Putin. Okay, I raise my hand. Where is I am for America? You know what I mean? Yes. Where is I am for America? I don't want my taxpayer dollars to be shilled and spent on corrupt Ukrainian government when my own American veterans are sleeping on the cardboards in the streets. What about me being for America? Why do I either have to be for Biden's lies? Or if I don't, I'm immediately put on this other side, going all the way back to Russia. What about me? I'm American. I'm for America. But I was quite surprised, like you said, that Mike Pence just puts everybody, including, I'm sure, Mr. Trump, his former boss, because his position is quite uh, polar opposite of that, Mike Pence. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Keep going. You said well, that media propagandists, they just label people and put well, you into this one or the other camp. Pence, Pence, Pence is, a, is a rather sinister figure in my view. This is, this is a guy, when, when he first took office under Trump, 
Trump gave him an extremely important assignment. And that was uh, Trump set up a commission to review the election systems in the United States, which are obviously corrupt. Obviously, we have the worst voting system on the planet. I don't know if there is a worse one than the United States. We have people who can who can put ballots that they write out into drop boxes that are unattended, no identification of who. It's a it's it's a sham. But anyway, uh, President Trump gave him this extraordinarily important assignment to run this commission on election integrity. He went through a little pro forma motion, but he knows his handlers did not want to have a clean election system. And so with very little fanfare, uh, I was watching carefully because I knew the importance of this election commission. And with very little fanfare, it, he shut it down. He withdrew. He said, oh, we can't, we can't get cooperation from some of the states. So I'm just going to stop it. Well, he did that before we had national elections that were so corrupted uh, as the one between uh, Trump and Biden, which was, I mean, a child could have seen. This was the most corrupt thing on the planet. You got I ran, I ran in 2020. I watched what was happening at night in my elections. Yeah, I have a lot of questions. More questions than answers. Yeah. 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 Well, anyway. Yeah. When when Pence when Pence took a took a dive and got out of that commission and shut it down, that told me that he's not responding to the to the needs of the American people. There's some some force, some group that does not want this looked into. And those must be the bankers that he responds to. But anyway, I have very little respect for him or, or for Pompeo or Nikki Haley, any of these warmongers who basically they make their, their, their lives on uh, getting, getting money from groups that want wars. Uh, I, I have a very low regard for each one of them. So uh, we'll see where things go. But I have a feeling, you know, the, the, the saying is, you know, uh, when I feel the heat, I see the light. And you look at what's happened with these, uh, these what, 47 or, yeah, or no, 56 Democrats who broke ranks on the Syria vote. All of a sudden, they're feeling the heat. They're seeing the light. The closer we get to the election, more people will be feeling the heat and more people will be seeing the light. So I think this is just the beginning of the shift. And I say, Matt, Ga Matt Gates from Florida, somebody ought to put up a, a monument to him as, as the guy who in Congress started the movement to shift us away from from what could ultimately be nuclear war unless we draw back from all of this stuff. Um, I have high expectation of him. I think, remember he was fighting with Kevin uh, uh, McCarthy for the rule change yes. uh, before they could seat new Congress. I think one of the points of contention was that Matt wanted to have McCarthy uh, or rather new speaker of the house um, not necessarily McCarthy, but whoever is a new speaker of the House, majority speaker, to put the bill up for vote regarding the term limits in Congress. And the Matt Getz was insistent that Congress would have an opportunity to vote on term limits. What do you think about term limits in Congress, a Senator, in United States Congress? Um, I think it's a great idea because my view, we have nothing ever changes we have political dinosaurs there for 50 30 40 years and 
only God knows how can they be uh, in their 90s or 100 years old, no pun on their age, but I am just saying as far as the continuity that people get elected and elected and elected for 50, 30, 40 years. We don't have any new people coming into Congress. And then we don't have term limits in United States Congress. Uh, I know state of Michigan where I'm at for the state Congress, we do have term limits, um, but yeah. not in United States Congress. So we end up with people like Pelosi and Biden who are in that position and, and, and forefronting our United States policies for 40, 50 years. And they're getting worse and worse and worse. No new people have a chance to come in because somehow they always get elected. I even saw the article that there were two um, deceased um, Congress uh, people who were still elected while being dead. I mean, how do how does the election system work if the dead people win elections? We know something is not right there, right? So do you think we need term limits? And I'm hoping Matt Getz will get his way and will put this up for vote now that he had um, my thought negotiated with uh, McCarthy to bring it up. Well, I, you know, I would probably vote <clears throat> in favor of term limits. Um, I, there are some mixed arguments on it. Um, I think I think we have a very dangerous situation with people who who have such lengthy continuity. And in addition to the politicians in Congress, we've got the bureaucrats uh, who man this vast federal bureaucracy, which probably could be slimmed down to a quarter of its size. Just get rid of all of these trolls who are out there doing, you know, the die principles, diversity, inclusion, equity, die. It's making America die. Um, and all of, we have so, so that's much- That's an love. abbreviation, die actually, D-I-E? Yes, yes. Boy, somebody was getting, uh, the pay above their pay grade to create that abbreviation. How would you come up with that? Oh my gosh, die. I, I think I think the liberals inverted the, the letters, but the conservatives use the use the letters die, D-I-E, diversity, inclusion, equity. Wow. And, and you know, of course, equity is is just uh it's just a relabeling of traditional Marxist. Violent I was just going to philosophy. say it's back to communism, socialism. That's what it reminds me of, because I yeah. was born in United in USSR. It's <laughs> the United States, USSR. So I know if, we've studied Marxism when I was little because it was mandated. It was mandatory. Yeah, you studied that thing all of, all the way through your university years. Yeah, well, that's what yeah. it reminds me of. Well, well equity. I'm, even even the Soviet Union didn't quite go to the outer limits with equity. Exactly. The, the one country that has has, has uh, really really executed the equity principle was uh, Cambodia when Pol Pot took over with the communists after the end of the the Vietnam War, and uh, he was a hardline Marxist. He believed that everything should be equal. Everything should be equitable. And so what do you do? Some people are smart. Some people are dumb. I mean, that's just a fact of the matter. You can only improve the intellect of, of people who aren't smart to a certain extent. You, you want to educate them as much as you can. But in... In Cambodia, they said, okay, well, we understand you can only bring people up so much, but what we can do, we'll create equity by destroying all of those people who have a higher intellect. And so they, them they literally, and, and there was a, a very fine movie made of this called The Killing Fields. And uh, uh, you can get that online, a tremendous movie. And, uh, and what they did is, they identified anybody who was suspected 
of being an educated person, an intellectual. So if you wore eyeglasses like I do, they would take you out and with a pickaxe, they, they didn't want to spend the money on bullets. So they would have teenage children and they would have it have, force you to kneel down and they would kill you with a pickaxe. And they, they destroyed 2 million out of 8, 8 million people. So, uh, so a, a quarter of the population of Cambodia were slaughtered in this vast bloodbath um, of people suspected of being able to read. If you could read, then you were a criminal under their system because that spoiled equity because not everybody could read. So you have to bring down everybody so that everybody's on the same level. That's what equity means. It means that in the United States, they just try to sugarcoat it, but that's what it's all about. I, I agree with you as far as that they took it further than Soviet Union, because um, I lived during Soviet Union times and whatever we have now in the United States, brought onto us courtesy of Biden, Obama, Pelosi and the company. Um, that reminds me more and more of a kleptocracy because it's not really a pure socialism anymore. Uh, it's uh, that mixed with financial oligarchy. It, it's mixed with uh, dictatorship. It's mixed with, it, it's like morphing. There is no name to it. The closest I can come up with is kleptocracy where they basically rob us and send our money overseas to people like Zelensky and we are you, American citizens are paying government salaries of Ukrainian state officials including parliament members Zelensky we're paying for their social programs we're paying for their medical bills what 51st state um, I grew up in, uh, like I said, Soviet Union territory of Ukraine. So I am from Ukraine. I speak Ukrainian fluently. I watch the videos of Ukrainian soldiers every day who complain that they have no weapons, that the parliament members of Ukraine raise their own salaries, send their own children abroad so they wouldn't be drafted into army. But Ukrainian soldiers the, their payments, their salaries are cut by parliament. They have no weapons. They're basically saying we're used as a cannon fodder. And um, they see the corruption of their own government. And we American citizens are being robbed. So the Biden could keep that lo money laundering operation called Ukraine and fuel corruption that actually kills more Ukrainian people. And I'm thinking this is kleptocracy, you know, they're stealing our money instead of providing the better standard of living for our own citizens, right, Senator, taking care of our veterans, of our seniors. What about inflation? People cannot even afford basics anymore. People can't go to grocery store without a new record breaking bill. But we keep sending billions to Ukraine. And well, a lot of a lot of people are saying, look, the southern border of the United States no longer exists. It's it's totally gone. The 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 four star head of the uh, of the uh, border patrol agency, the the one who's sort of the on the ground guy in charge, uh, yesterday told the told a committee. He said, we do not have operational control over the border. Now, what does he mean by operational control? Certainly, there are always going to be a few people who slip back and forth. So that doesn't count. What he's talking about is essentially who governs the southern border? Does the United States of America govern the southern border? Or do Mexican drug cartels govern the southern border? Mexican drug cartels, they, they own the southern border, they control it, they pay people, uh, well actually they make huge amounts of money to bring people and, and some, of these, <coughs> some of these Democrat multi-billionaires fund the people to move down. But 
there, there were a thousand people the other day who were just on a bum's rush. Just they were yelling and joyous and happy, uh, and and they just burst through the border. Border control uh, patrol can't can't control them. So they they come if they want to come. They take our country. They take our social security benefits. These are people who are going to go on social security. They're not going to be paying into social security for 50, 60 years before they get it. They'll be here for a few years and they'll get it. Same as any American would get it uh, for working a, a full lifetime. And, and Americans are saying, well, wait a minute. You, you remember the struggle President Trump had trying to fund the border wall yep. that he did? It was oh, like that was too expensive. Oh, that was, what yes. is it, five billion? Oh, that was too too much money. We cannot do that. Yeah, and I think five five billion was kind of a figure that was thrown out. But you, if the oligarchs, if the boys from Davos won a war in Ukraine, bingo, $140 billion, no problem. We'll run the printing presses. We'll do whatever we want. And Americans are saying, wait a minute. What is going on in this country? Who does the country exist for? Do American people have any, any relevance? Do we count for anything? Look, we've got the federal government coming in and <clears throat> they're buying up all the tr space in trailers so they can house illegal immigrants. Now, they go into a, a low cost trailer park where you've got a, a couple who are on social security and they're just living from, from paycheck to paycheck, social security check. And all they can do is they can afford that, that uh, trailer in a rundown trailer park. What happens when the federal government comes in and buys out the whole thing to put in illegal immigrants? What happens to those people? Those are the people who go into cardboard boxes, laying on the streets, dying uh, because uh, they, you know, they just can't, uh, they can't uh, deal with it anymore. So anyway, I think people are fed up. They've, they've had a, they've had all they're going to take uh, with money being sent overseas and, and not here.